believe it or not, we're having our first Pushkin talk in, uh, in the 19V series, uh, which promises to be appropriately titillating, if not shocking. Um, uh, and this is a, a talk by Lia Vinitsky um, of Princeton University called Alexander Pushkin's Gabriliad uh, and the Erotic Utopia of an American Socialist with Sebesednik Maxim Hanukai, University of Wisconsin-Madison. Very excited to welcome you. Please, Ilya. Uh, thank you very much and thank you for the invitation. As I just mentioned that we have a kind of Iliad uh, uh, in addition to Gabriliad, Ilya Klieger and Ilya Vinitsky, if there are other Ilyas, uh, uh, I'll be happy uh, if you join uh, the, uh, the, the team. Uh, so, uh, as you notice uh, from the short description of uh, my presentation, uh, it won't be on the 19th century. But uh, to be sure, 19th century, I believe, is as long as a scholar wants it to be and can justify uh, uh, his, her, or their um, uh, case. So the uh, major question uh, which I'd like to raise uh, here is how does 19th century work? and a very important uh, work function uh, in different circumstances, different contexts, in different country, in a different uh, period. Um, what I mean is America of uh, the uh, first uh, uh, two or three decades uh, of the uh, 20th uh, century, which ideological meanings and implications uh, uh, does uh, this uh, Russian work in, uh, um, in this case uh, ascribes uh, in a foreign uh, context. This is also a part of my project on something which I call personification translation. The translation uh, uh, which um, absorbs and uh, not only absorbs and adapts, but also translates someone else's experience uh, into your own and uh, is inserted into the translator's uh, biographical um, uh, legend. Uh, uh, ironical or not, there are so many cases uh, when uh, the translation serves this role uh, of self-expression by means uh, of absorption of the uh, foreign text. It's also an attempt uh, to introduce an idea of the author-translators community, like the secret society of uh, writer-translators, uh, which may be a subject of uh, scholarly uh, research as uh, well. Uh, last but not least, uh, there is some special um, symbolic uh, uh, moment uh, in this presentation because the uh, archive uh, of uh, Max Eastman, uh, who translated uh, Gabriliad, as you know from the description, uh, is housed uh, at NYU Library. Unfortunately, they sent me uh, copies of the uh, manuscripts, which I'll show in my uh, PowerPoint presentations. And I also want to mention uh, uh, here that uh, uh, I presented this uh, talk in Russian at Middlebury College. There was a very interesting uh, uh, discussion. And one of my former students kindly agreed uh, to translate the text. Uh, so the text I'll present uh, is also, as you will see from uh, Max Eastman, um, um, uh, case uh, at joint uh, project, language joint uh, project. The name is um, Fiona Bell and she, uh, from Yale University, and she will join us a little later because she has a class. Now, let me share the screen with you. And I'm going to the, I already forgot where slide uh... Yeah, it's already, already open. So all you need to do is press from beginning in the left-hand corner. Uh, where is it from beginning? Here? In the in the left hand corner, at the top left hand corner. Uh top on a slide. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh from beginning, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And now display settings and swap presenters, and we are all set, I hope. Just one second. Does it work? Yep. Uh, perfect. Uh, uh, so, uh, I also want to emphasize, just before I turn uh, uh, to the uh, text, uh, that the uh, proposed uh, discussion uh, of a personifying translation is not a departure from the study of Pushkin's own work. Ultimately, as I will try to show in this talk, it is a return to Pushkin's work via the defamiliarization by translation, as it were. It is the very same unseen hook 
uh, and invisible line that in the words of Chesterton's father Brown is long enough to let him, that is Pushkin, wander to the ends of the world and still to bring him back with a twitch upon the thread. That's what I'll try to do uh, in, the, uh, in the end. Uh, my focus is uh, the first uh, translation of the Gabriliad um, uh, into English, and for that matter, into any uh, foreign language uh, by uh, Max uh, Eastman. Just very, very few words uh, uh, about uh, Pushkin's poem. Of course, we all know about uh, it uh, a lot. So this is a travesty of the Annunciation uh, plot of the birth of Jesus uh, based on uh, Luke, um, uh, uh, basically. Um, Pushkin's Gabriliad uh, content warning, just in case, uh, was um, uh, written in 1821 in uh, Kishinev during his uh, southern uh, exile. Uh, it's well known that the uh, uh, that Pushkin imagination was uh, triggered by French uh, libertine tradition. Voltaire, especially uh, Parny, have, has been discussed uh, in a number of very important publications since the 1920s. Uh, it's not, uh, there's a typo, sorry, not anti-clerical, though, uh, a blasphemous travesty of the Annunciation, uh, but a sort of a parody in blue man's sense of the romantic, um, idealistic concept of love, Schiller or Zhukovsky in Russian case. It certainly designed, uh, was designed not for publication, uh, but in formal and dangerous circulation. Uh, it is uh, based on the violation of a number of taboos, and it also introduces uh, Pushkin's self-fashioning and forges a special poetic voice, uh, Boltavnia, with playful allusions uh, addressed uh, to a friendly uh, circle of the, uh, of the poem. Uh, I can imagine young Pushkin chuckling wildly as the verses uh, flowed, uh, hopping about the room uh, in, uh, in astonishing, uh, in astonished delight at some idea even more hilariously prominent than uh, the last. Uh, it is a strongly life-affirming work, in fact. As humor, there is tenderness uh, in his portrayal of a 16-year-old coming at last uh, into full duration of her body in the distance by the uh, wonder of her discovery. This is the quotation from A.D. Uh, uh, Thomas, who also translated um, the, uh, the Gabriliad uh, into um, uh, English. Uh, the poem uh, circulated in numerous copies, uh, well, numerous, we don't know how many copies, uh, to be sure, they were uh, produced uh, in the 1820s. Uh, uh, through uh, 1860s, where, uh, and uh, it originated a criminal case against Pushkin in, in 1828. Pushkin acknowledged uh, his authorship uh, uh, to the uh, emperor. The first publication uh, occurred in London in 1861. Agarov published uh, this um, poema, and uh, in Russia itself, only in 1918, after the revolution. So the poema uh, gets its oppositional anti-imperial connotations, which were important uh, for um, uh, Eastman. In 1921, the first translation appeared into English. In 1974, uh, there was a Christmas issue by Playboy um, uh, with publication of Gavriliade in Walter Aron's fascinating uh, version with illustrations by a Japanese-American um, artist, uh, Kinuka uh, Kraft. So this is sort of background uh, for, the, uh, for the talk. Uh, my focus is uh, uh, my focus um, is on Eastman. Eastman, 1883-1968, uh, was an American poet, novelist, essayist, socialist, feminist, uh, friend of uh, John Reed, the editor of left-wing modernist magazines, The Masses and The Liberator. He was also uh, Leon Trotsky's uh, biographer, translator, and an official literary agent, introducing Western readers to Lenin's so-called uh, testament. Uh, in, uh, in July 1920, uh, uh, um, uh, um, he, uh, he was also uh, um, in 1927. Eastman's translation of Pushkin's poem uh, was uh, published uh, uh, in the uh, Parisian Anglophone avant-garde magazine Transition under the title Gabrilia. Um, this issue also featured translations of Alexander Bloch's Miznakonka, 
uh, and another installment of James Joyce Finnegan's Wake, uh, which had debuted uh, in the magazine's previous uh, issue. In 1929, a separate edition of Eastman's translation was published uh, in New York with elegant illustrations by Rockwell Kant under the title, Gabriel, a poem in one song. In the introduction to this exclusive book, which had a print run of just 750 numbered copies and was printed on Arnold unbleached green wove English handmade paper, the translator calls Pushkin and Chaucer the happiest of all great uh, uh, poets. Um, uh, this is uh, the copy uh, of the manuscript, type manuscript, uh, which is now at NYU University. And this is the cover of Gabrielle, um, uh, the poem uh, published by Eastman in 1929. Um, Eastman goes on to recount the story of Pushkin's blasphemous poem written in, 1920, uh, in 1821 during a period of intense revolutionary agitation in Imperial Russia, his words. He notes, not without a certain boasting, that in his translation completed in 1923 in a small town in the Caucasus, he has su uh, successfully re uh, recruited um, uh, both the latter and the fluid, cheerful, and graceful spirit of the, uh, of the uh, original. Uh, all the strokes of Wita Pushkin's, every thought and sentiment are also. He made a couple of changes um, as, uh, as well. Eastman also admits that he allowed only one serious deviation from the original, namely he did not translate the beginning dedication of the poem in which Pushkin address, uh, addresses uh, a certain young Jewish uh, woman. Behind the sparse information about the process and uh, aesthetic objectives of the, uh, this translation, lies a very interesting and revealing story that in my opinion presents an important cultural and hermeneutical problem. The translator's conscious use of a foreign text to express his own content in a new cultural, historical, and biographical context. And of course, for the new audience. I call it Ars Translazioni. First of all, it should be said that Eastman's choice of this work uh, for translation was clearly no uh, accident. Oh, may I ask you if uh, uh, the sound is okay? Can I, anyone confirm, Sasha? Sound is good. Ah, perfect. So the son of a Protestant uh, priest, an atheist, and a lost romantic uh, self-description, uh, Max Eastman was not only an influential journalist, but also an extraordinary uh, Don Juan, even for the generation of the 1910s and 20s, and a proponent of hedonism, nudism, and free love. He was also an enthusiastic admirer of Russian literature and the Russian language which according to his articles and memoirs over the course of 40 years, he diligently studied in bed with Russian women while in the USSR from 1920 to actual uh, Russia, um, Soviet Russia 1922 to 1924. A freshly minted American socialist, Eastman had come to see this new exploitation-free world firsthand. Eastman even developed and advertised his own flutter linguistic system for learning Russian through maximum physical rapprochement uh, with its native speakers, a completely inappropriate methodology, despite the radical communicative-based approach in recent second language acquisition practice. He presented the system itself on par with the insidiously eloquent serpent uh, in Pushkin's Gabriliad to the public for the first time in 1925 in an article for the magazine, The American Mercury, entitled On Learning Foreign Languages. I will focus only on the final stages of Eastman's proposed process. You can see uh, the long quote on the screen, uh, which is based on his own experience and begins by becoming acquainting, uh, acquainted with a native speaker who possesses the requisite external features. For you are going, uh, Eastman writes, to spend a good deal of time gazing on them in comparative silence in the full year of a vacation uh, home. Uh, so, and or if you employ your power with delicacy, as I have advised, uh, so that she does not either run away uh, from you in fright uh, as from an intellectual monster or in a fit of mad pride, buy a grammar, um, 
and learn her own language. You can retain this position of lofty helplessness uh, throughout the duration of the romance. For at every stage of the proceeding, your mind will know more about the language than hers. Her knowledge is in her tongue. The end of this uh, quote. For Eastman, another rapid and effective means of mastering Russian was to translate the national poets. He began with Lermontov and soon took, uh, and soon, uh, soon after, undertook Pushkin and Gisenian, freely admitting that each of the literary texts he worked on expressed his own personal uh, thoughts and uh, uh, feelings. In May 1924, with new impressions fresh in his mind, Eastman published a remarkable article uh, in Asia magazine entitled The Russian Soul and the Russian Language. Um, the temperament of the great Russians as revealed by the whimsies of their speech. He suggests that the gentle and resilient uh, Russian soul is reflected in Russian grammar and literature above all in the poetry of Pushkin. An ardent lover of Russian culture, Eastman insisted that the Western myth that Russian people are characterized by a love of suffering and earthly anguish is completely false. Russians are naturally cheerful and psychologically robust, he argued. It is the lack of good translations of Pushkin that prohibits Western readers from understanding and appreciating this moral health and good uh, cheer. Here's the quotation uh, to the uh, right. Dostoevsky might have been hanged, you know, and Gorky stuff, or to make it happier, Pushkin might have been translated. And then our impression of Russian literature would have been entirely different. Never was mirth more native, wit more fluent, buoyancy more beautiful than in the poetry of Pushkin. Pushkin's poetry has more sunny, liquid happiness in it than any other great poetry in the world. And it has perhaps a more sophisticated grace." End of quote. Eastman also argued that Russian is inherently similar to English, though it differs from English for the better in some essential ways. For example, the complete absence of, in Russian of, a quote, all the small dust of articles and preposition. And here, my subtle remark uh, is that I completely agree with this observation. I fully sympathize uh, uh, it, to be sure. An absence that he considers poetically bewitching. This language, he writes, uh, this makes a, a language, he writes, sound to us like children playing or a grown up people sending playful telegrams, end of quote. Moreover, he declared, Russian literature holds a special charm for the American ear, even in a literal translation. Uh, as examples, he offers word for word translation uh, of a fragment of a Lenin speech about the Treaty of brest and Pushkin's poem, Night, Noche clearly, love and revolution, the title of Eastman's final memoir of 1964, had always been inseparable in his life and, um, uh, and his work. All Russian readers uh, certainly know this poem, uh, uh, but look what he does with it uh, in English uh, by uh, verbal and grammatically is a morphically translated it. My voice for you, Kersin and languid, uh, stutters, late silence, dark night, uh, near couch, mine sorrowful can, uh, candle burns, my verses pouring and uh, purring, and the end. Uh, my friend, my tender friend, I love yours, yours. This radically literal translation, which deliberately violates the norms of the English language, is not an avant-garde experiment like the grammatical revisionism of Eastman's friend E. Camp Cummings, but proof that the Russian language, according to Eastman, is like English in its fundamental way of talking. End of quote. It is significant that to demonstrate the linguistic charm of Russian poetry, the American translator and libertine chooses one of Pushkin's most famously erotic poems written in the same southern period as the Gabriliad. Metaphorically speaking, this is a kind of synchronous and performative translation of the poetic description of another's sex act uh, in his uh, language and his experience a literal merging with the original in ecstasy. As Eastman concluded in the above article, mentioned article about learning Russian, you say wild things and you say them with enormous and sincere enthusiasm, enthusiasm about your ability to say them. It is not only learning a language when you learn it according to my system. It is taking a little breath of the free, superficial and inconsequential life of the gods.
Max Eastman tried to master Russian as he would a woman and vice versa. And he really did have an, uh, a schoolmistress, or he called her Uchitelnitsa. In early autumn uh, of 1922 in Yalta, Eastman, who was traveling south uh, to gather more impressions uh, of this new world, became acquainted with a young vacationer by the name of Nina Smirnova. She is not on the picture, of course. We don't have the picture whom he described in his memoirs 40 years later. Nina's husband, an engineer from Kharkov, couldn't join his wife on vacation because he was busy with a long-term construction project. As Eastman hints, a comrade Smirnov wasn't able, generally speaking, to fulfill his marital duties. Eastman and his friends spent uh, the summer studying Russian, going skinny dipping, and uh, making love in the Crimea paradise, as described nostalgically in the writer's memoirs, Love and Revolution. In Eastman's perception, this love story, as if embroidered uh, on the same canvas as Lady with the Lap Dog, but completely devoid of Chekhov's anguish and moral torment, reflected the deep revolutionary changes in Russia and promised the coming happy transformation of the world. According to Eastman, his married lover once confessed that she wanted to have a child with him. A few months later, he visited her in Kharkov and learned that she had actually conceived from him, but had lost the child in a miscarriage after a fall. This romance with uh, its exotic Southern setting, Pushkin's Crimea, its discarded seventh commandment, its inadequate husband, its idenic uh, fashion trends, and its secret conception by a lover from another world, I believe is the hidden subtext or biographical stimulus uh, of Eastman's translation. He translated a poem that tells in a lively and bold style of the strangeness of love and the awakening liberation of the flesh. In a sense, the American visitor translator chose a lively, talkative Russian poet as his confidant. Uh, this, is the trans um, um, uh, this is the translation uh, which I uh, actually refer to. Let us discuss the curious way of life. I had no other subject uh, to discuss, very Eastmanian. And uh, in the um, in the end, uh, it is not true. Is it not true that in the friendly throng we seek out and we find a confidant to whom the secret voice of passion's torture we can translate in idioms of rapture? We love to blab about it to our friend. So the friend, this confidant, uh, is uh, um, uh, Pushkin, the author. Meanwhile. The main or secret addressee of Eastman's translation uh, of the Gabriliad was apparently not his Crimean teacher, but another uh, Russian female companion, the sister of Nikolai Krylenko, Soviet commander in chief, chairman of the Revolutionary Tribunal, and uh, future People's Commissar of Justice. Eastman, a special correspondent uh, for the New York world, um, had met her in uh, Jena uh, in Italy at an international conference. Miss Krylenka was 12 year, uh, years younger than Eastman and served as a secretary to the People's Commissar Mikhail Litmil, uh, Litvinov. Eastman recalled that the first time Krylenka saw him from her window of the hotel where the Soviet delegation lived, she threw a rose at his feet. She was beautiful, slender, muscular, resembling, as one of her contemporaries put it, Jota's emphatic little angels with her long, narrow eyes uh, high, uh, cheek, um, uh, high cheek bones and short curly hair. Eastman dedicated poems to her, conjured her in prose and made her the main character in his memoir published after her death. Most of all, he liked her in, ex uh, in uh, exhaustible cheerfulness, kindness, lack of bourgeois jealousy and her ability to love him as he was. In Love and Revolution, Eastman recalls that he told her all the details of the parallel Yalta romance and that she was happy for him. In a poem that he published in 1931, Eastman represents her as his muse. Not only did Krylenka take care of her unfaithful friend childlessly, he always called her love a sort of salvation, but she also introduced him to the Soviet elite at um, a time of uh, acute and uh, fateful crisis within the communist, communist Party and the international revolutionary movement as a whole. It was this woman who brought Pushkin's poem to Eastman uh, in the Caucasus, Sochi to be exact, where he was working on his first novel, Venture, and a biography of Leon Trotsky at the same time. Eastman remembered literally pouncing on this poem. 
Its translation saved him from the temporary creative impotence, he argued, caused by the demon of despair that haunted him. In this therapeutic translation of the Gabrieliad, the American uh, symbolically expressed his long professed passionate love for the language he had learned in bed with the Russian beauties and for the most graceful master of the language, I quote, Pushkin. Of course, for all his language skills and enthusiasm, Eastman could hardly translate this rather difficult and long text quickly without the help of a native speaker. In this case, Krylenka herself. Most likely, I believe, they continued work on the translation until its first publication in transition in 1927. It is tempting to assume that the poet's Russian lover helped him understand the linguistic play and the dark passages um, uh, arts, uh, of the Gabrielia. This translation, the first uh, in the West of Pushkin's blasphemous erotic poem, fit well with the ideological biography of the translator himself. One highlight was the scandal caused by the publication in the January 1916 issue of The Masses, a magazine Eastman edited of a ballad about the Virgin Mary's natural rather than immaculate conception. This ballad's author praised Joseph as the biggest man in creation, a kind and loving husband who knew that his child had been fathered by another man and who generously forgave his sinful wife. In publishing this, Eastman continued his own campaign, which he began in 1913 against the religious hypocrisy and puritanism of American society. This provocative ballad about the Virgin Mary and Joseph provoked a storm of indignant responses and led to a public boycott, a hot hit for the publication. The masses stopped selling on the New York subway. Columbia University Library removed the blasphemous issue from its uh, shelves, and the Canadian uh, government prohibited uh, its circulation on Canadian territory. In a response uh, to critics, uh, first published um, in the uh, masses and later included uh, in a separate edition uh, of uh, the scandalous ballad, Eastman attacked uh, his uh, ideological opponents for their hypocrisy. Eastman obviously associated Pushkin's erotic poem, first published in full in Russia in 1918, with new revolutionary trends and extraordinary free wars uh, in the young republic after the end of the civil war. Incidentally, in 1923, Vsevolod Holt's workshop staged uh, Sergei Tretyakov's play Neparzach, its uh, abbreviation of Neparochne Zachatie, a play based on Pushkin's Gabriliad, commissioned by the Central Committee of the Komsomol and intended for the Komsomol's anti-religious Christmas celebrations. The struggle against the religious doctrine of the Immaculate Conception occupied an important place in Soviet propaganda and received a literary treatment in the well-known opening of Mikhail Bulgakov's novel, uh, The Master and Margarita. At the same time, according to his later memoirs, Eastman did not read Pushkin's work in the context of Soviet anti-religious propaganda, but in the general context of the sexual liberation and experimentation that he saw firsthand of that new, realistic in his terminology, attitude towards the problems of sex and love. In the first half of the 1920s, uh, this attitude was equally attractive to the left intelligentsia in New York, Paris, and Moscow. Moscow, he recalled many years later, seemed to him then, I quote, in its sexual code, a sort of generalized Greenwich village, end of quote. In his articles and memoirs about the USSR in the early 1920s, Eastman wrote constantly and expertly about the free and honest sexual practices uh, of the Soviet people, uh, which were radically different from those of conservative bourgeois America. He also spoke of the passionate ideological disputes about free love in party circles and the young republic's society. Eastman was undoubtedly attracted uh, to the merry, anti-dogmatic ideology of Pushkin's poem, which rid uh, ridicules the jealous, dull, hypocritical and vindicative, vindicative creator. Finally, the aesthetic and a theoretical basis of Eastman's translation of the Gabrieliad, I believe, was the theory of humor and freedom that he developed in his 1921 book, The Sense of Humor. In the section of uh, this book entitled Humor and Sexuality, Working from Freud, Eastman argues uh, that uh, laughter is uh, freedom uh, from the chains that bind uh, every uh, human uh, being. The theme of the uh, Immaculate Conception, central to Pushkin's blasphemous poem, 
also finds a peculiar refraction in this book. In it, the innate ability to laugh is directly likened uh, to the highest divine miracle. It is significant that in the second publication of this, uh, of this translation, uh, of his translation of Pushkin's poem, Eastman changed its name, emphasizing not its burlesque epic genre, but instead the personality of the title character, the blue-eyed, fair-haired Gabriel, with whom he obviously associated himself, a messenger of good tidings to the new world. It seems Eastman's translation was filled with allusions understandable to its main addressee. Apparently, this biographical subtext was somehow connected with Eastman's refusal to translate the insignificant introduction to Pushkin's poem. In the finale of the Gabrieliad, the playful narrator promises to improve and settle down, and he addresses a certain Yelena, whom he is or will be ready to marry. In the context of Eastman's biographical legend, this confession seems to take on it to take on a deeply personal meaning. It is noteworthy that the American poet, let me just, um, uh, it, uh, that the American poet uh, changes Pushkin's saw video uh, to uh, found, and my soul uh, is subject, my dusha plasna to I will be uh, faithful. So this is, I'll just skip it, yeah. Uh, bless my uh, repentance, I have changed my ways. I found my Helen lovely uh, as your Mary. To her I will be faithful all my day, uh, days, and in the end. But time flies on, the little stealthy days are silvering the fingers of my hair. I soon my, uh, must took more sober, uh, soberly on life um, and seal my wedlock with a lovely wife. It is remarkable and clearly significant for the translator that Krylenka, Russian muse and Eastman saver from the demon of despair, was also named Yelena. No less remarkable and significant in the biographical context is the fact that she, as we already know, was the one who brought Pushkin's poem to her beloved in Sochi. This translation of the Gabriliad did not just reflect, but was modeled on the love story of the prematurely graying uh, Max and uh, Elena. The fallen year, Max Eastman, uh, this to paraphrase uh, Pushkin's uh, verse, ambassador of love, shining son of the United States, as if keeping uh, the just and promise of the poem's lyrical hero, really did marry Elena. The couple spent uh, their honeymoon uh, in uh, Antibes, uh, where they met Francis Scott Fitzgerald and other members of the American cultural, uh, di cultural diaspora. Eastman considered this the happiest period of his life. His biographer recently published photos of Max and Yelena in the birthday suits uh, and Edenic, uh, Edenic uh, environs of Adam and Eve. In their happy picture of the world, there was certainly no room for the idea of original sin and its accompanying shame and remorse. Just look at the newlyweds' faces. One might interpret these photos as a representation of the blessed state of Pushkin's Adam and Eve, who discovered the del delights of love, love with the help of Satan. As might be expected, the American Don Juan did not change his habits after marriage. The union of Max and the ever-given Elena was open from the beginning. Elena tried not to be jealous of her husband's revolving door of mistresses. She also had lovers, but not in such numbers. In one of the chapters of his memoirs dedicated to Elena, Eastman calls their marriage a quote, a pact of independence. In Eastman's egoistic and sexist philosophy of love, Elena was the reincarnation of the ideal wife whose purpose in love uh, in life was to, I quote, nurture the creative talents of the male artist. In other words, Eastman realized his theoretical ideas and expectations in his own marriage, finding a charming wife who could provide unconditional support for his intellectual and sensual adventures. The following poem uh, by Yelena Krylenka, published in 1943 uh, in the Russian language New World, Novy Journal, um, uh, in, in, uh, New Magazine, I'm sorry, probably reflects uh, that his wife thought uh, about uh, in the absence of her husband. И когда уйдет он сильный, снова в шумный свет, пьяный, радужную пылью, я рассыплюсь след. 
1927, Max and Elena arrived in New York. In 1929, Kovic chief reader uh, published in the words of the Amer an American critic that charming edition of Pushkin's gorgeous poem about the human adventures of uh, the angel Gabriel, which I mentioned at the beginning of this novella. At the time, the Kovacif reader specialized in exclusive publications of highbrow erotica. In 1929, they were in a legal battle uh, with the state authorities uh, who uh, accused the publisher of distributing books that threatened public morals. Eastman's translation of Pushkin's poem appeared in Kovacif reader's illustrated series um, entitled Politica Erot uh, Poli I'm sorry, Polite Erotica, uh, which featured works such as Margaret Radcliffe Hall's lesbian novel, The Well of Loneliness, works of Francois Villon, uh, Pocaccia's Decameron, The Canterbury Tales uh, by Chaucer with illustrations by the same Rockwell Kent. In creative collaboration with Rockwell Kent, uh, the publication reflected a new affair in this American Don Juan's love life. Even 1923, the poems Maria, in love with Gabriel was meant, as I proposed, to, the, uh, to be Eastman's girlfriend in Yalta. By now, he had a new candidate uh, for this literary role. Ioni Robinson, a Jewish looking, according to Eastman's 16 year old beauty and talented artist, who was working with Kent on the illustrated edition uh, of uh, Candide by Voltaire. She met and became close with the Eastmans uh, in the summer of 1927. She gave Elena Eastman, who would later become a professional artist, her first painting lessons. Charming by irony, Eastman not only found a way to free her from the overly demanding Rockwell Kant, but also taught her his catechism of free love. I quote, don't kiss anybody you don't want to and kiss everybody you do want to if you can. This is the first and the great commandment, the end of quote. It appears that Kant's illustration for the translation of the Gabrieliad depicts her as the 16-year-old Mary with her serpent, serpent uh, seducer. After completing his unusual happy, uh, his usual, I'm sorry, his usual uh, happy mission, Eastman returned to his wife, whom uh, we assume he reinvokes in the 1929 edition of the Gabrieliad using Pushkin's appeal to Yelena as his ideal spouse. In other words, Pushkin's Gabrieliad, translated into English, uh, verse uh, by someone Adam Gopnik called a radical epicarian after his return home from a sexually liberated Russia was imagined as a playful poetic confession, a new testament of the natural and full-flooded realistic uh, love that as uh, Eastman believed is a condition uh, for creating an ideal society. The word realistic is the word which he used. Meanwhile, in projecting the erotic plot of Pushkin's poem into a conservative American environment, Eastman might have imagined his work as a call for the emancipation of sensuality, leading the modern American woman towards a knowledge of her own body, towards self-affirmation and bliss. Indeed, the interpretation of the Annunciation of Mary as a deliberate celebration of the human body and its infinite capacity for pleasure anticipated the feminist interpretation of the poem by male researchers that was typical of the 1970s and 1980s. I will skip quotes. This is uh, um, one of the illustrations by Rockwell Kant on page 20, uh, uh, 29. Finally, the attention of this indecent, in quotation mar uh, mark, Marxist, could not fail to be attracted by the humorous paradox in Pushkin's version of the uh, Emancipation. And this is, I would say, very important for my argument. Christ, the new religion, is in fact the son of three fathers uh, in Pushkin's poem. Lenin's sacramental phrase about the three sources and three component parts of Marxism comes to mind. In other words, this new materialistic faith originates from Satan, the denier, Gabriel, the ardent lover, and the powerful God who fell in love in his old age. In this erototheological mamma mia, it doesn't really matter whose child this is, since he is a child of love, a testament of love. Now I'm turning to the last part of uh, the novella. Uh, I call it Between God and the Devil. The elegant 1929 edition for the few so important as we have seen in its author's biographical myth, went almost completely unnoticed in America, but provoked with some significant delay 
an extremely negative response in the Soviet Union. The reason for this was, of course, Eastman's reputation as the active assistant, biographer, translator, and unofficial literary agent of Trotsky uh, in America in the second half of the 1920s uh, and the 1930s. Eastman aroused Stalin's anger as early as 1925, when in his book, Since Lenin Died, he included the main points of Lenin's testament, which he published in full the next year in the New York Times. In the early 1930s, Eastman, with the help of his wife, translated Trotsky's history of the Russian Revolution. In 1932, uh, Max and Yelena visited the disgraced uh, leader on the Turkish island of Principa. Uh, in the mid-20s, Eastman published an article about the tragic fate of writers in Stalinist Russia, artists in uniform, a study of literature and bureaucratism. Organized, uh, he also organized the American Committee for the Defense of Trotsky and declared at the end of 1932, uh, at a New York rally that the construction of socialism in the Soviet Union is over. This would be the subject of his new book, The End of Socialism in Russia. In 1937, his translation of Trotsky's The Revolution Betrayed was published to great public response. Finally, in March 1937, Eastman's film, uh, uh, film Chronicle of the Revolution, Tsar to Lenin, debunk the myth of Stalin's uh, historical role uh, in the October Revolution and Civil War. In a letter to the New York Times, published on March 2nd, 1937, Eastman identifies this film as one of the, male, uh, of the main uh, reasons for Stalin's anger, which resulted in a number of practical measures intended to discredit Trotsky's American associate. Tsar to Lenin, premiered in New York on March 6, 1937, almost immediately after the second Moscow trial, the case of the parallel anti-Soviet Trotsky Center. In the film, Eastman reads voiceover text that he wrote. Central to the Chronicle are images of the last emperor, uh, Nicholas uh, uh, II, and the leadership of the revolution, uh, Lenin and uh, Trotsky. Stalin appears only once at the end of the film, accompanied by a sarcastic command from the narrator. I'll show you the uh, uh, picture. Acutely satirical, the chronicle depicts the activities of the Orthodox Church, which glorified and uh, buried Admiral Kolchak, who was defeated by Trotsky's army. Karl Radek, a, a victim of the second Moscow trial, is shown several times in close up. Christian Rakovsky and Eastman's brother-in-law, the Soviet commander-in-chief uh, Nikolai Krylenko, you can see uh, him in the film, also appears. In a year, uh, Commissar of Justice Nikolai Krylenko would be arrested, tried by the military collegium of the Soviet Supreme Court, and executed. To the best of my knowledge, uh, Yelena Krylenko was the only family member who survived uh, because she was in America. Remarkably, even in this historical and political genre, Eastman remains true to his uh, libertine ideology. In France, he managed to purchase unique footage from the family film archive of Nicholas II for $1,000. The film depicts the emperor skinny dipping uh, in the royal pond. In Tsar to Lenin, these shots are accompanied by a joyfully ironic comment uh, from uh, Eastman. For the first time in world history, the king appears in his true form, an obvious reference to the emperor's new clothes. In his 1964 memoir, this old nudist presents the theme of the naked emperor without any political overtones. Nicholas is shown, I quote, not dressed at all, naked of grandeur, completely naked, glistering like an otter, certainly a unique contribution to these visual stories, end of quote. Trotsky appears uh, in close-ups many times uh, during the film, while the only momentary shot of Stalin, as Eastman quipped, was doubled in duration to lend him greater significance. Immediately after the premiere of uh, Tsar to Lenin, the American communist press, the Daily Worker, at the command of the Kremlin, called on the workers and the leftist uh, intelligentsia to boycott the slanderous film. The Soviet embassy told American uh, film distributors um, that uh, should Tsar to Lenin continue playing, Soviet films would no longer be shown uh, in the United States, especially the popular Eisenstein. Finally, in his uh, uh, report uh, to uh, at the fifth plenum of the Central Committee from March 3rd, 1937, that is almost simultaneous uh, to the American premiere of the film, a vengeful Stalin devoted a whole paragraph to Eastman. 
Borrowing a phrase from Mikhail Sotekov Chidrin, Stalin called uh, Eastman a gangster of the pan, a famous crook, and the leader of the rabid Trotskyite horde in America, which lived only by slandering the working class of the USSR. Stalin's political nickname uh, for Eastman was immediately taken up by Soviet propagandists and American and British pro-Stalinist uh, communists. In the letter quoted above in the New York Times, Eastman sarcastically remarked that he considered Stalin's words about him as a crook and gangster of the pan to be a chief honor and a high point of his uh, political life. Stalin's attack on Eastman at the March plenum was not spontaneous, but premeditated. This is uh, uh, indicated, I believe, by a belated lampoon review of Eastman's translation of the Gabriliad, revealing the title The Trotskyist Marador, Trotskyist Marador. The review is signed with the initials BN. I don't know who the author is. It was published in the February issue of the Literaturne Gazeta, which was dedicated to the upcoming centennial of Pushkin's death. The Trotskyist translator's mockery of Pushkin's erotic poem is presented in the Literaturne Gazeta anniversary issue as a bandit attack on the Soviet people's cultural heritage, the crude literary rape, so to speak, of the Gabrilia. To be fair, we should emphasize here that Eastman, certainly an ideological enemy and whistleblower of Stalin, was never an orthodox Trotskyist, Trotskyist an extreme uh, individualist and an opponent of any dogmatic faith of straightforward dogmatic uh, style. Uh, he denounced not only the cynical and bloody cult of the hypocritical and vindictive father of nations, but also the haughtily ascetic way of life the historical and economic sophistry bordering on religious uh, fanaticism, disguised religion, of the Mephistopheles Trotsky. He called him Mephistopheles. The latter, in turn, spoke ironically about Eastman's indi individualistic worldview. According to Trotsky, Eastman's thinking was marred uh, in the freedom of conclusion, freedom of indifferentism, freedom of passivity, freedom of literal dilettantism. Accordingly, I suggest that this translation of the Gabrielia written at the same time as Trotsky's biography, uh, uh, was not only a linguistic and poetic exercise, not only the author's attempt to overcome his creative crisis, but also subconsciously a sort of emotionally ideological, linguistic free chatter versus the monologic sectarian political jargon, antidote to dogmatic Marxism. From the beginning of, this, of his stay in Soviet Russia, Eastman compared Marxism to a new religion threatening individual freedom, a great solemn fetish uh, of dialectical materialism, which is nothing but the old shoes of the almighty God, end of quote. It is amusing that in the American press of the early 20s, Eastman was invariably and in a single breath called both the translator of Trotsky's history of the Russian uh, revolution and of Pushkin's Gabrilia. The conclusion. For Eastman in the 1930s, Pushkin's Gabriliad, the most striking manifesto of his erotic poetry, became a landmark work in the ideological struggle for a living, free Pushkin, a movement that reached its peak on the eve of the centennial of the poet's death. Seven years after the publication of the American edition of the poem, Eastman published a long article in the conservative New Republic. He became very conservative in the 30s. Pushkin and his English translators in which he ridiculed the famous pro-Soviet translators of Pushkin, Babette Deutsch, and especially the sex bigot Abram Yermalinsky for hypocrisy and authentic deafness. In Eastman's opinion, the translation by Yermalinsky uh, suggests uh, that their author belongs to a different biological species than Pushkin. Eastman again likens Pushkin to Chaucer, compares him to Byron, emphasizing that in wit and elegance, the Russian poet uh, surpasses the English romantic. And he also places him beside Sappho and Catullus, Vion and Robert Burns. I think it is not an exaggeration uh, to uh, call um, uh, this fragment another one of Eastman's passionate declaration of love for Pushkin, a poet who belongs to paraphrase the famous words of William Blake to the same satanic party as Sappho, Catullus, Vion, Chaucer and Burns. Eastman's unfortunately forgotten article about Pushkin's lyrical humor and poetic freedom, in my view, 
is at the origin of one of the most fruitful traditions uh, in the history of the Anglo-American reception uh, of the poet's works. Vladimir Nabokov's arrangement uh, of and co uh, commentary on Yevgeny Onegin, Golden Gate by Vikram Seth, Translations and Imitation of Pushkin's Light Verse by A.D.P. Briggs, Walter Arndt, and D.M. Thomas, as well as studies of Pushkin's romantic irony and poetics of literary prankness, prankishness, Charles by Bill Todd, Monica Greenleaf, Michael Wachtel, Carol Emerson, Andrew Kahn, Svetlana Ivdakimova, Alisa Gillespie, and Joe uh, Pasquier. And so, Pushkin's Gabriliad, found to paraphrase, uh, to paraphrase Baratinsky, a, con a congenial foreign reader in posterity. By the way, it is worth noting that unlike the author of this playful erotic poem, Eastman, who lived a long life, seems to have remained in the charming captivity of the ideas uh, and uh, feelings of the lyrical uh, ego of his uh, personalizing translation. This work might be called a joking gospel of iconoclastic individualism. Uh, modernist self-expression and the religion of free love professed uh, by the American um, Greenwich Village and early Soviet Bohemians of the 1920s. An elegant, immodest monument to a turbulent era, exactly 100 years and some uh, 4,662 miles away, distant uh, from Pushkin's uh, era and country and from us. Thank you very much. I'm stopping sharing. Thank you so much, Ilya. Uh, Maxim, um, your comments. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay, so thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Ilya, for this very interesting and uh, dare I say stimulating uh, talk. Uh, and of course, to the organizers of the 19V series for inviting me to participate in this event. Uh, since, since I was told to limit my comments to uh, about five minutes, I will simply share a few thoughts that I had uh, while reading the piece and also pose uh, maybe a, a few questions to help start discussion. Um, so the first thought that occurred to me as I was reading Ilya's analysis of Max Eastman's translation of uh, the Gabriliad, uh, and I have to confess that I had only a vague awareness of Eastman before reading this paper, so it was really interesting to me for me to learn about uh, him. Uh, so the first thought I had is that Eastman's approach to translation uh, was strikingly similar to Pushkin's own. And uh, Ilya, in fact, goes into this a little bit in the conclusion of the paper that I read, but I, he didn't get to it in the talk. But so maybe we can use this as an opportunity to talk more about it. But uh, so as a poet who was, on the one hand, nurtured in the poetic culture of the long 18th century with its proclivity for wit, elusiveness, and circle poetics, uh, and on the other hand, a man very much in tune with the main developments of European Romanticism, uh, with its cultivation of subjective genres and experiments in blurring the boundaries between life and art. Uh, Pushkin uh, himself often appropriated the work of other poets, uh, using it, uh, as Ilya says of Eastman, uh, and I'm quoting here, um, to express his own content in a new cultural, historical, and biographical context. Uh, so to mention just a few examples of such translations and transpositions, uh, his translations from Byron and Chenier, his, uh, of course, Feast in a Time of Plague, uh, which is, uh, for the most part, a very close translation of uh, several scenes from John Wilson's City of the Plague, uh, his Angela, uh, which is, uh, again, scenes from Shakespeare's uh, uh, Measure for Measure, and as Ilya suggests, uh, in the conclusion of his piece, uh, the Gabriliad itself, which may be seen as a translation of sorts, although maybe I would pref prefer to use a different term, uh, adaptation, travesty. Ilya himself uses also blasphemous, blasphemous exegesis uh, for it. Uh, so in other words, like Eastman's, Pushkin's own translations are often neither domestications nor for, for, foreignizations, as Venuti uh, calls uh, two types of translations. Uh, nor do they resemble translations by those among the Romantics uh, who sought to capture the spirit of some original, although it does that too, I think. Uh, but rather using the term Ilya proposes, they are personalizations um, which uh, require readers to have at least um, some familiarity with, um, uh, with Pushkin's personal and professional biographies. Um, so my first set of questions for uh, Ilya uh, is, uh, so to what extent do you think Eastman was um, aware of this aspect of Pushkin's work? I'm actually not sure to what extent Pushkin's scholarship at that time was 
um, kind of a right, working in this mode and could have, could have uh, modeled his approach on that of Pushkin himself, uh, in some ways channeling the spirit of the original through his own act of creative appropriation. Uh, so you mentioned that he also translated other poets. Um, have you been able to, for example, determine to what extent Eastman um, personalized those translations as well, or uh, whether his approach is different when he translates other poets? Um, and, the same, and, and at the same time, um, uh, uh, Kanta Scour's familiarity with this feature of Pushkin's work uh, perhaps mistakenly lead him to, to uh, him or her to see elements of personalization in the work of other poets or translators in this case, when in fact uh, there may be uh, none. Uh, and I have to admit that at times while reading the paper, I couldn't decide to what extent this was a sincere, I would say, scholarly endeavor or kind of job-like performance of a partic particular image of a Pushkin scholar who attempts to interpret uh, kind of everything uh, not everything, but uh, uh, who interpret Pushkin's work through a kind of biographical lens. And uh, you can, this tradition goes back to Ahmadva at least, and uh, more recently, uh, even you know, my own uh, mentor, Columbia, uh, but it's part of uh, kind of uh, um, um, sort of um, pushed for this kind of approach to Pushkin, and it's in fact a very uh, valid and uh, uh, I think uh, fruitful one. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah. Uh, and so my second uh, comment is about the timing of the translation and its publication. Um, so as I understand it, Eastman began working on it uh, in the early 1920s while traveling in the Russian South uh, and first published it uh, in 1927. Uh, so during this time, as we know, the atmosphere in the Soviet Union had changed uh, significantly um, uh, from the early exuberance of the post-revolutionary years to the beginning of the Stalin uh, the Stalin period and his consolidation uh, of power. Uh, so in light of this context, Eastman's decision to publish his translation reminds me of, uh, of the literary and scholarly activities also of the Russian emigrate writers in Europe uh, earlier perhaps, but still at this time, uh, who took it upon themselves to preserve and perpetuate Russian culture abroad, often by developing their own mythologies uh, around Pushkin. Uh, and the difference here, of course, being that in Eastman's case, what he sought to preserve was less the great Russian culture that was displaced by the uh, revolution uh, than the uh, liberating and libertine spirit of uh, the revolution itself uh, that had been uh, uh, um, quashed by, by, by Stalin. Um, so I'm curious here, um, I'm, you know, especially since you mentioned the anniversary uh, in, in, your, um, in your paper um, and you talk, uh, was was there any response to Eastman's translation also by uh, emigrate writers at the time and uh, uh, who had their own version of uh, Pushkin? I don't know to what extent how this uh, uh, the Gavriliad would uh, fit into it and uh, the sort of translation of Gavriliad, which clearly has kind of political uh, motivations behind it. Um, and um, uh, just in general, how would you compare his Eastman's approach? Um, uh, to the attempts of other writers or even, even scholars who sought to personalize uh, Pushkin uh, uh, in part perhaps uh, out of political motivations. Uh, and here again, not just the immigrants, but even someone like uh, in scholarship, uh, someone like Yuri Oltman, I think has a very kind of personal uh, uh, approach to Pushkin and, uh, and kind of made, it, made him his own in some ways and projected a lot of his own kind of ideals onto, onto Pushkin's works. Uh, and finally, uh, I'm struck uh, by your concluding quote, not in a in talk, but in the paper, there you had a concluding quote from Zhukovsky. Um, maybe I'll find it since you didn't uh, read it, but um, let's see, where was it? Um, uh, who said that uh, the translator of prose is a slave, but the translator of verse is a rival. Um, and so I wonder to what extent can we read uh, the, uh, 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 that his Isma's translation of the Gabriela not uh, simp not as an uh, homage uh, uh, to a great poet uh, whom Eastman identified with the libertine spirit, but also as a kind of uh, erotic sublimation of poetic rivalry, uh, which shifts the arena of competition from the poetic sphere to the sexual one, a level where Eastman uh, would presumably easily triumph over his model, uh, who may have cultivated an image of a Don Juan, but was in fact rather chased by 20th uh, century standards. Uh, and uh, here I couldn't help think uh, also of uh, a short story by uh, Limonov, uh, Krasayevs of the Knavlyashe Payeta, 
uh, in which Limonov uh, visiting London enters into a competition with other Russian poets, including Mandelstam and Brodsky, not through his poetic writings, but uh, through his superiority in sexual conquest. Uh, so I'm just curious to, to what extent you think that element is also there, perhaps in a kind of more a, a playful way, a playful way, uh, way and uh, also perhaps in, in, sp in the spirit of Pushkin's poem. Um, so maybe I'll stop here and, you know, feel free to pick up any or none of those uh, questions, uh, but uh, maybe that'll hopefully it'll help start some discussion. Uh, thank you, Maxime, for the intellectual pleasure. Uh, um, so I can combine a couple of questions. Uh, uh, you asked excellent questions uh, into uh, one. First of all, of course, uh, Pushkin's Gavriliada uh, itself uh, was a, prog a product of a specific uh, historical period, which I discussed in the part which I did not articulate due to the lack of time. And this is the period of uh, translation of uh, New Testament uh, into uh, Russian, uh, the debates between various uh, groups. It's also the great uh, age of translation uh, in uh, Russia. And uh, Pushkin's retranslations, Pushkin's polemics uh, with the preceding generation, Zhukovsky, was also uh, in play. Although I argue that the poem is not anti-clerical at all, it's in line with um, uh, Je Viktor Zhivov's idea of uh, Russian blasphemous poetry, which is not blasphemous, but pursues uh, literary aesthetic uh, purposes. Uh, it's also paradoxically both uh, uh, rooted in the uh, French um, uh, libertine tr uh, tradition, but it predicts the romanticism with its rendering uh, of uh, the uh, holy plot, holy scriptures uh, by Blake, by uh, um, starting from Milton, actually, their father uh, uh, figure, uh, and, um, uh, and Byron. So from this perspective, uh, Pushkin's uh, poem did fit uh, into the general uh, romantic uh, historical uh, uh, process, but it focuses mainly not on ideological, uh, but on aesthetic uh, issues. And it also introduced a model uh, which was so attractive uh, for its readers, uh, interpreters, and foreign translators. The model uh, of this uh, uh, like encrypted uh, story uh, of your own self, there are so many interpretations of whom Pushkin actually implied by names of uh, Yelena and Yvrieka. Uh, so there's an entire uh, debate of this. And I know for sure, and actually these are the characters of my other sections and parts of the work, uh, that uh, some interpreters, uh, literary critics of uh, Gabriliad, uh, encoded their own personal stories uh, in their articles on Gabri uh, Gabriliad. I just don't have time to mention this. Uh, not only in Russia, in Russia it was um, um, uh, Lerner, uh, the infamous uh, uh, Pushkinist, who claimed that he married a 16-year-old uh, uh, Jewish um, uh, girl while writing about um, um, Gabriliada and converted her to Christianity. Uh, uh, to a British uh, uh, scholar, uh, Cochrane, I may mispronounce his uh, last name, who translated, uh, a Byron scholar who translated Gabriliad uh, into uh, uh, English and staged out some of his uh, theoretical uh, insights in the form of translation. So I would say the poem is an invitation. It carries the spirit of the Romantic age and it uses translation and personalization as integral parts of its message. So that's uh, the general uh, response uh, uh, to a couple of the questions. As for uh, playfulness, as for parody, well, let me be a little bit more uh, provocative than I usually am. I strongly believe uh, that any scholarly article we, my dear colleagues, produce secretly or overtly are self-parodic, uh, especially if we are attached to certain ideas uh, very, very heartily. So from this perspective, uh, I am aware that in certain moments I play uh, with potential uh, readers. The book's title actually is Princeton de Cameron. So that's why I tell the story and I play uh, uh, with it. But I think that I can respond to any critical uh, comment in regard of whether the fact uh, which I uh, introduce matters and, uh, or not. Because I think the idea of uh, poetry, of humor, uh, as uh, aligned with ideology presented by um, uh, Eastman, found its ideal testing ground. So that's why the poem attracts as a magnet, uh, biographical facts as well as ideas, because it establishes a certain model uh, which fits well into the personal myth and ideological um, beliefs uh, of uh, the translator. And as for uh, other uh, uh, examples, 
Uh, and there was also a question about uh, did Eastman take a position in the Nabokov-Wilson exchange uh, on uh, Evgeny Onegin? He did not, as far as I know, but I do believe that they belong to the same uh, tradition. They made the point, pre uh, point pretty uh, clearly. Humor, lyricism, Pushkin as an antidote uh, to any uh, uh, hardcore ideological system, whether this is a kind of um, very right uh, or very uh, left. And that's why they tried uh, to find the way how to uh, uh, carry their political message uh, by means of diffamizing, making fun uh, of a streak, uh, um, uh, authoritarian or totalitarian uh, uh, conception for the sake of individuality. This is, again, I play with what I, um, individualism, not um, uh, Marxism with individual face or anti-Marxism with individual face or something uh, like that. And ironically, Pushkin was on their banner. And excellent questions. If you can send me, uh, I will think about them and incorporate some of them into the uh, uh, final um, product. Great. Thank you, uh, Maxim and Ilya. I, um, I would like to turn it over now to questions. And please either indicate in chat that you would like to ask one and then uh, ask one uh, orally or um, write them down and hopefully Sasha will, will read them, right? And since now I can see uh, Fiona, my personal thanks uh, to Fiona, and Fiona may confirm that I try to challenge uh, Fiona and uh, maybe uh, other um, uh, students to translate Gabriliada again. So what would have been a new Gabriliada, and especially interesting Gabriliada translated uh, not by a man, as it happened um, uh, 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 before. <laughs> oh, uh, you are muted. You should be able to. There you go. Yes, now no, it works. Uh, okay, the wonderful talk. Thank you, Ilya. And uh, one, um, my, my question is uh, surprisingly, perhaps not not about Pushkin, uh, but about the twenties the 1920s, mm -hmm. uh, and um, you see the influx of biblical uh, rhetoric, biblical language as um, appropriated as revolutionary language in poetry specifically. Mayakovsky, of course, is a prime example, uh, but uh, in, prose, uh, in prose as well. So how mm -hmm. much this uh, interest in, in, in Gabriela um, can, um, can be seen as rhyming with this in, influx of church Slavonicism and church Slavonic and biblical mood as the spirit of the ancients. Mm -hmm. Well, it's an excellent question. I did not uh, do the uh, uh, stylistic analysis of Eastman's uh, uh, translation. Uh, and I'm not a native uh, speaker, so that's one of the reasons why I uh, primarily uh, focused uh, on uh, ideological and major aesthetic uh, uh, issues and personal biography uh, of the uh, author. But I did notice uh, that uh, Eastman remained untouched uh, by the anti-clerical, anti-religious uh, campaign of the 1920s uh, in uh, uh, Russia. He was not interested at all in Mysteria Booth, uh, uh, for, uh, for example, uh, he never mentions Mayakovsky's uh, pre-revolutionary oblique, uh, 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 oblique of Stanach. For him, this uh, uh, poem, Pushkin's Gavriliada, uh, was a sort of declaration of uh, free uh, love and attack uh, on any fixed form. So I would say he was more romantic, more Byronic uh, in uh, his approach uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to the text. And again, uh, I was so much surprised uh, that some of my conclusions eventually led uh, to Zhivov's uh, observations uh, uh, regarding uh, the nature of uh, Russian uh, body poetry, um, uh, which is not political, like in uh, France, for example, uh, or, but mostly uh, um, trying to uh, 
resolve uh, ideological issues by aesthetic means. Uh, uh, as for uh, Slav uh, Slavonicism, I don't know. Do you have any observation or suggestion you are willing to share? <laughs> I will really appreciate it. And I forgot to mention that there were at least uh, six translations of Gabriliad in English, and all of them follow Eastman. So this is a response to uh, Maxim's question, not the readers perhaps, but the practitioners. Because uh, in another article, which is gonna be published uh, by Pushkin Review, I show when one uh, really playful and naughty mistranslation of Pushkin's poem uh, by uh, Eastman, probably as I believe by suggestion of his uh, wife, Elena, migrated from one English translation uh, to another. Seven, uh, seven or six, I don't remember exactly, uh, English translation, keep this mistranslation, which is of very bad nature. Well, uh, ironically, uh, but all French, German, Czech, Ukrainian translations, they translate everything correctly. So Eastman definitely had an impact uh, upon other uh, you know, translators. And there were translators like Walter Arndt, for example, or, uh, or Thomas, or, who uh, acknowledged the influence of Eastman. Eastman, he was very important uh, for them. And they returned to Eastman, whether they agreed or disagreed with him on various uh, stages uh, of the history of Gabrieliada uh, in America and in England. Uh, so the poem may so uh, sound it more uh, free love uh, or, uh, or feminist, uh, so it depends uh, on concrete historical uh, period of um, you know, perception, but they all created this kind of translator's brotherhood, not sisterhood, unfortunately, uh, which is centered uh, the Pushkin's um, uh, poem. And we have a question from Grigory Utkov. Uh, if you want to go ahead and uh, unmute yourself. Sure. Thank you, Ilya, for a re very interesting talk and a very, very fruitful discussion and, 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 and a whole bunch of opportunities. I should confess that I missed the very beginning, you know, when I started to calculate, to recalculate each time into the time that we use here in Eastern Europe, you know, I missed the very beginning, but my question concerns uh, the topic uh, which, uh, uh, which interests me, uh, uh, and it, it is about Literaturne Gazeta. Could you please get back to this, get back mm -hmm. to this part? What follows what? Uh, uh, was that anonymous or, you know, signed by initials? Yeah, mm -hmm. was that, was that criticism of Eastman? Did that appear before the film? from Tsar to Lenin or after. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, that, after. And, that's, and that's January, February, 1937, if I'm not mistaken, right? Uh, yes, I have to double check uh, the dates, but it's definitely uh, uh, in uh, connection uh, with. Uh, the Soviet reception of Eastman's translation uh, uh, is, well, basically, there's no reception until this article. There was only one uh, reference uh, to the translation uh, a little bit uh, earlier, uh, in the early 1930s. Uh, but uh, it uh, focuses not on Eastman, of course, because Eastman was already persona non grata, uh, but on Rockwell Kent, who was a good guy uh, for the Soviets. Uh, but this uh, passionate, uh, uh, like, kind of criticism and panic um, uh, review of uh, Eastman's translation of Gavriliade using the Stalin's uh, term Maradior, Trotskyist Maradior, uh, is definitely related uh, to the film. The film was already known to the Soviet agents because they tried uh, uh, to put a hold on the film uh, for a couple of years. So there were real problems um, which uh, Eastman um, um, met um, while producing and presenting the film. And actually the Soviets won uh, the game. Uh, so they did not allow the film to be spread uh, all over the United States. So there was only one or two uh, um, uh, performances. But the actual uh, review in Literaturne uh, Gazeta represents uh, this historical style uh, of uh, Soviet denunciation of uh, Trotskyist. But the irony is that they presented his translation as violation of uh, Gavriliad. 
They even use some sexually loaded uh, terms, although unaware of uh, this, perhaps, uh, to attack uh, those uh, terrible, uh, this terrible American uh, uh, Trotskyist uh, who pakusilsa na nashu svituju gavriliado, which is kind of um, a par uh, paradox. Never ever uh, someone's the defense of Gavriliad from this particular um, um, uh, position. What is interesting for me is how many things from so different contexts intersect and can be assembled uh, into something which Boris uh, Mikhailovich called motivne uh, analysis, kristalliska rishotka of uh, the um, uh, interpretation. And politics is definitely there. And Stalin, who hated Eastman since 1925, uh, somehow contributed to the discussion of the uh, Gabriela. Mm -hmm. Eric, please. Eric? Uh, uh, sound. Yeah. I have a question, Ilya. That was a great talk. I have a question uh, um, following up on your last comment, uh, response to Maxime, which is um, about your own methodology and, mm -hmm. um, and presentation. And I, I know you've been I've been reading a lot of Pierre Bayard, who I know you have, have read as well. Um, mm -hmm. And he talks about, um, one of the things he says somewhere is that scholars don't realize that we too have narrators. Um, mm -hmm. And that, um, you know, we can choose different narrators for, for, different, uh, for different works. Um, and so I'm wondering what, what, are, the, what are the limits? I mean, if, you're, if you were doing a, uh, a graduate seminar on the, on, on the kind of, um, the sins that still remain, right? The lines that 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 one wouldn't cross. Um, uh, what would they What would they be for you? Um, and then, just a, a purely kind of informational question is um, um, on the on the on the czar uh, skinny dipping. Um, um, you know, how do we know that it's the czar since he's not wearing any clothes? Uh, you know, this is a, um, uh, is, it, is it just, you know, Eastman's presentation of it or? Um... Oh, no, ar archival uh, newsreel, which you bought for one. Uh, it's a long episode, actually. You can see the czar. Uh, I just showed one uh, shot, uh, oh, but it's like two or three minutes long. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, oh, sorry for interrupting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's, that's that was just the, the kind of point of information because a czar has to be closed, clothed to be a czar, really. You know, once he yeah. takes the clothes off, he's, he's no. The longer. film shows uh, how he undresses before, yeah, okay. and then he jumps uh, into the water. I just picked up the uh, episode. It's, it's definitely an excellent question, which uh, you ask, and I ask the question myself uh, about the limits. But this is a rare case when it's really easy to answer the question. First of all, because uh, of archive. Uh, Eastman archive is voluminous, uh, and uh, the huge uh, part of the archive uh, is uh, in uh, Indiana. Uh, hello, Liz, uh, Eliza Gibal. I would definitely ask you to help if possible. I know that you are here. And uh, most of um, references to Gabriel Yad and to certain facts related to Yelena Krylenka, and I, think I just drew from archival sources which were published and which I uh, was happy to, uh, to obtain. So in this particular case, uh, I can justify the usage of certain hypotheses. I just didn't have time to do this by references to concrete letters uh, of uh, Eastman uh, in which he mentions the Pushkin uh, or uh, the Russian concept of free love or uh, uh, concept of immaculate conception and so on and so uh, forth. From in this particular case, uh, I believe that the claims are substantiated uh, by documents. Generally speaking, from my personal uh, point of view, the limits are uh, common sense. So if uh, common sense suggests that this is too far away, I can always sacrifice uh, uh, certain hypotheses because why do I need it? It may be playful and interesting. Uh, in a certain genre, it may work. Uh, but if I publish it in an academic journal, I would just sacrifice uh, the thing uh, which I like and believe in, but it is most like literary uh, uh, association. But once again, uh, in terms of um, uh, Eastman, uh, all these things like related uh, to uh, uh, Ioni, um, uh, the, the artist and her uh, portrait, stylized portrait uh, in the book actually have, I bought it online 
that's uh, Eastman's first edition and the only edition of, uh, of Gabriel uh, with Rockwell Kant's uh, illustrations. Another part of archive is at NY, uh, NYU, like uh, handmade, really personal. So personalization is already presented uh, uh, in the uh, very artifact uh, of this um, edition, which had only 750 um, uh, uh, 50, uh, 50 copies. And okay, probably I'll tell something uh, more provocative uh, 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 than needed. Uh, if you are driven by certain things, it's better to collect uh, whole observation and then to get rid of something uh, which you consider as not substantiated um, to the much. It's again the, uh, in response to a question uh, about the limit. And I avoid any reference to methodology uh, uh, here uh, because uh, an analysis requires. Uh, methodology. If you need another methodology, you can marry one methodology to uh, uh, to another uh, uh, one. I sound post-structuralist. I don't know, uh, or maybe naive, but that's what I believe in. Could I just uh, jump in with with a question uh, using my uh, privilege? Of, of being another Ilya at the, at the, at the assembly. Um, I, I, I was wondering, Ilya, this is really super fascinating uh, to me. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about uh, two things, related things. One is how did um, Eastman's kind of politics or political theory work, uh, right? Because it's very confusing, right? On the one hand, he's a socialist, on the other hand, He's a kind of uh, individualist. These two don't necessarily have to contradict each other, but one does have to kind of bring them together in some way. On the one hand, he's a Trotskyite. On the other hand, right, um, it's unclear at what point, but he seems to make a, a kind of not atypical transition from a Trotskyite to a neoconservative or conservative. Neoconservative is a little bit uh, probably anachronistic uh, since he dies in 69, but a conservative who publishes in the National Review, right? And and so uh, what does he think? How does he imagine in this early times, right, his uh, his socialism and the good socialism, a socialism within the, with an individual face, and then whether or not his, his understanding of Gavriliad um, changes as his political uh, convictions shift, whether he, um, you know, continues, I assume, to, to value it, but whether his, the reasons for his high evaluation change or, or right? Since, because the question of ideology is so prominent um, in, in your analysis, I was kind of wondering what, what else is happening in, in the longer durée of his, of his biography. Oh yeah, uh, it's, I think it's a great question and it's not that easy. And at the same time, it is easy to answer the question. The easiest way is, say, uh, is to say that uh, his main principle was that his ideology uh, is always evolving, that he did not want to fix it into a certain uh, place. And he always disagreed uh, with something uh, which prevailed and which he has aligned himself um, uh, before. He chose uh, Trotsky uh, because of his dislike of Stalin and, uh, and bureaucracy. Whenever he feels that there is some kind of uh, wall being established, uh, uh, fanaticism uh, and um, uh, dogmatism, he immediately attacked this uh, as an extreme uh, individualist. He was also a poet. He was also interested in uh, aesthetic uh, uh, issues uh, as a homegrown um, uh, aesthet aesthetician uh, uh, philosopher. And humor and distancing and romantic irony uh, meant a lot uh, for him. I don't want to draw any parallels, but I would say that the case of Eastman although he was not that great uh, as a poet uh, and thinker, is something similar to Heinrich Heine um, uh, or, uh, with political uh, odyssey, uh, very whimsical, 
So he changed his mind. He always like tried to move away from one uh, to another side by keeping his own personality and he is uh, defiant uh, to any uh, established uh, forms. When he was younger, of course, he was more radical. When he grew older, uh, he became more uh, conservative and aligned himself with Hayes uh, and with New Republic and with the libertarian movement, although he did not like uh, when they called him uh, libertarian. But this is easy thing uh, to understand why he liked this kind of Pushkin or shape this image of Pushkin, uh, who is like Pushkin of uh, uh, Sinyavsky and Gabriel. Uh, I'm sorry, Sinyavsky, not Gabriel. <laughs> um, the playful uh, Pushkin na, na erotických nožkách varvavšichse uh, v literaturu. Uh, so this is why it's difficult to uh, answer is because he never changed actually. When you read his members of, 19, of the 1960s, the same old uh, uh, man who still uh, uh, rewind in his memories all his numerous uh, affairs, uh, some of his uh, lessons, they sound like uh, in, uh, in Pushkin, as if Pushkin made fun of him uh, as, uh, as well. So from this perspective, it looks as if ideologically uh, he is uh, changing by means, you can trace the trajectory, but in fact he is, um, himself uh, all the time. That's what makes him so different from uh, from from Pushkin. And uh, in the fifties, uh, he was very much well. He was involved into the um, McCarthyism uh, uh, process, although he rejected McCarthy very soon uh, as fanaticist. But it's true that he was afraid of uh, Marxism, which was the womb ideological uh, for his uh, uh, emergence as a writer. Uh, in the uh, early 1910s. I don't know if I answered the, uh, uh, this question. And once again, I don't want to ever estimate him uh, to say that this is a great translation. This is just a very interesting case of personalizing ideological biographical uh, of the text. And it shows us uh, how Pushkin works abroad without just saying, oh, he changed something, he mistranslated something, he made a mistake, this is mutilation rather than uh, uh, translation as Nabokov would say. So, and of course, you, uh, you are right uh, that, um, and uh, uh, Eric also mentioned this, this is a Bloomian approach. He, uh, Pushkin is his, ri uh, is his rival and his friend at the same, um, uh, at the same time. So it creates uh, this tension and unity. I placed an accent on unity, but one can also place an action, uh, accent on mistranslating or on irony, but the irony which is as if addressed uh, to Pushkin from this great beyond, look what I have done with, the, uh, uh, with your poem, do you like it? And last but not least is the fact that I do believe, and this is the hypothesis, unfortunately I am unable to prove, that Yelena uh, Krylenka participated in the translation as well. And there is her voice, somehow incorporated uh, into um, uh, the text, because there are cases which he was physically unable to translate from Russian the way how he did. So we know that she participated uh, in translation of Trotsky's um, uh, works and in Capital uh, by Marx. What if she did contribute uh, to this uh, uh, playful uh, poems um, uh, uh, translation? It's an interesting actually uh, issue. So it's not his own, that's their mutual uh, or a project and inside joke, if you will. Thank you, great. Uh, I, I see another question. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Venya Gushin, would you like to ask your question aloud or should I just read it for you? Sure, I can ask aloud. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, hello, yeah. Um, yeah, thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, you've already sort of touched upon uh, the question uh, in your in your last response, uh, bringing up Sinyavsky, um, but I'm curious about the quote that you shared uh, about the false reception of Russian literature as serious and what role Pushkin plays in this, um, and sort of like what is Eastman doing by highlighting uh, the light side of Pushkin that um, following Boris Kasparov, it could be called uh, early romantic as opposed to the late romantic nationalist figure. Um, that Pushkin um, had to be made into uh, by, say, like Dostoevsky, for example. Uh -huh. Excellent question, Vinya. Can I respond to your question uh, about the story uh, with the story? Sure. <laughs> uh, uh, I remember my impression when I was a, uh, a student, a graduate student, I would say, when I read um, 
uh, Valentin Nepomnichi, uh, a Russian Pushkinist from Emily uh, essay uh, on Pushkin, in which he tells a story that once upon a time, uh, someone uh, rang uh, his, uh, knocked his door. He opened the door and he saw uh, a young girl uh, who looked like a peasant girl uh, with a naive and sincere uh, face, uh, which, uh, and she looked like very agitated. I looked at her and I immediately uh, responded uh, to the question which I read in her face. Da, Pushkin napisal Gavriliadu, no on patom raskailsa. So this is exactly uh, uh, the case. And he was absolutely serious. And he was a very talented, actually, scholar. Um, uh, he was absolutely serious in this. This kind of prophesying Pushkin. Pushkin with prophet uh, um, as uh, the master of uh, poem. Not Pushkin uh, as uh, Sinyavsky's uh, uh, Pushkin. This is deeply in Russian culture. But the same thing as a replica happened uh, in uh, England, uh, in Germany, uh, with um, Bodenstadt uh, translations, and uh, in uh, America. They presented Pushkin as the national poet who is serious and whose major works are, I don't know, Boris Godunov, and of course, the opera. No one laughs at Boris Godunov. Uh, this is a serious uh, opera, even if there is um, uh, uh, Urodivy, he is not a subject for um, uh, mockery. This is a tragic voice and a tragic uh, figure in the opera and uh, in the uh, um, uh, um, drama, tr uh, tragedy. But playful Pushkin is something relatively uh, uh, new. And it was uh, um, uh, Eastman, I believe, who introduced this side of Pushkin and he actually addressed uh, this introduction, act, uh, he oriented this introduction against uh, the very idea of Russian literature as gloomy, melancholic, and serious one, uh, exemplified not even in Pushkin, but he's good enough or prophet, but in Dostoevsky. That's why he makes fun uh, of this. It's not the issue whether he's right or he is not. Both things are correct, but it's a polemical device. And he wanted uh, to introduce this kind of uh, playful, uh, Byronic, but not in the southern uh, poems, uh, but uh, in Beppo, uh, like uh, or Don uh, Juan's um, way. So from this perspective, he did uh, follow this romantic uh, agenda uh, to introduce a new type of Pushkin, who stands for Russian uh, poetry and Russian spirit and the spirit of revolution, not as represented by Dostoevsky, Stalin, sorry for the par uh, parallel uh, Lenin, but by those dissidents, uh, by those uh, uh, frivolous or mischievous uh, actors uh, who move uh, culture forward rather than freeze it all uh, through. Thank you. So I don't know if, if I answered um, uh, 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 this question, but... Uh, and once again, there were other translators uh, who referred uh, to Eastman as the one who helped them uh, to see the other Pushkin. Walter Arndt is perhaps the most important one. He first published uh, um, Pushkin's erotic poem, uh, Tsar Nikita i Semi uh, in uh, Playboy, and his 1974 uh, publication of the Gabriliad with illustrations of Kinoka Kraft uh, is actually a masterpiece. Uh, and it's also part of the American culture of uh, mid 1970s, uh, 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 with all its pluses and minuses, uh, of course. Kinoka Kraft also uh, drew a portrait uh, uh, of uh, another playboy uh, who was published uh, in uh, the journal, Evgeny Ivtushenko. And she portrayed Evgeny Ivtushenko as naked, uh, in, uh, making love uh, with uh, a blonde um, woman. So she didn't remember actually how it happened. I was in touch with her. But uh, when I compared uh, this uh, particular you know, portrait, Yevtushenko uh, and uh, the blonde uh, woman uh, with curly hairs with the portrayal of the scene in uh, um, Gabriliad, I saw the resemblance. So she actually used the same uh, visual language, um, recirculated it in a way uh, in regard with Pushkin and Yevtushenko. I don't compare the writers. Great, and we have a question from Olga Ost. Um, in a context of this presentation, it becomes obvious that different people have very different expectations of what is going to happen after revolution. Some may just associate revolution with sexual freedom. 
who actually supported him here in the U.S. How in those times could he have had that kind of lifestyle? Thanks. Oh, this is a good question. And uh, I know who supported him when, uh, while he was in Russia because Korolenko and Trotsky and uh, the uh, Soviet left uh, uh, liked him very much. So he was one of, uh, uh, one of them. And he uh, was a delegate uh, of the uh, Comintern uh, uh, Congress. So he had some protection, but he left really, really fast because he carried a very uh, toxic document, Lenin's Testament. Uh, so it was uh, an escape, fortunate escape, and both of them uh, were able to leave uh, the uh, uh, Soviet Russia. In the United States, uh, he was quite rich. He was a successful journalist. Uh, he was a part of Greenwich Village uh, left uh, uh, community. Uh, he uh, created at least uh, two influential uh, magazines, The Masses and The uh, Liber uh, Liberator. He played an important role uh, in Harlem Renaissance um, uh, as well. So he had a lot of uh, supporters, a lot of readers. And when he came from Russia, of course, he had this flavor of someone who was inside of this major drama of the 20th uh, century, the Russian, uh, the Russian uh, uh, Revolution. The way of life uh, he conducted, I'm not sure that it differed that much, say, uh, from the way of life uh, of other inhabitants uh, of Greenwich Village. I know for sure that um, Bob Chandler, an American modernist uh, uh, artist, uh, had perhaps even more uh, provocative and despicable uh, uh, way of uh, life uh, in the 1920s. That's the concrete period uh, when in certain areas uh, of New York, uh, these things happen and uh, were uh, prom uh, uh, pr promoted uh, by certain individuals who served as Harbingers as ideologists and practitioners uh, of a new type of uh, sexual uh, free uh, behavior. Sorry, I don't know if I answered the question, but if you're looking for some concrete uh, donors um, uh, who help him, I, I, unfortunately, I don't know. And I do think uh, that uh, there should be uh, a work, uh, a research uh, on Yelena Krylenka. She's a talented poet, an artist, uh, a human being, uh, and her voice should be heard as well, because that's a very interesting and I would say depolarizing uh, perhaps um, idea uh, that she contributed uh, to this Trotskyist um, uh, uh, movement uh, uh, translation, and she participated uh, in her uh, husband's uh, and intellectual uh, friends as well, um, self-fashioning uh, 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 process. Any more questions? If there's no more questions, may I ask a question if it's possible to translate Gabriliat nowadays and how would it sound? It's a question to translators or those who are interested in translation. <laughs> Is the silence the response? Fiona, what do you think? <laughs> I don't know. I think um, if I were doing it, I would have to sit down and think about, um, you know, the jokes and who the jokes are on. Um, what institutions are they poking fun of, uh, poking fun at, and then um, who might get tangled in the middle? And my suggestion is that, like, maybe women <laughs> as a group get tangled in the middle or get thrown under mm -hmm. the bus somewhat, but. Um, yeah, I think it'd be interesting to try. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, Ilya and Maxim. This was incredibly stimulating, as as Maxim said. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, it was. Um, thank you for the discussion, everybody. Um, and uh, we'll see you next time, hopefully.